Ah, welcome. Right this way. Enjoy the film. Luigi's Mansion is one of those rare Nintendo games that no one seems to know about. <clears throat> I can't believe I actually said that. Oh, hello there, fellow spook lovers, to a very special episode of Beta 64, where I bring a video back from the dead, specifically my first ever video on Luigi's Mansion. Back then, we didn't really have a clear picture on the development of the game, and we especially didn't have a lot of ways to view the files for these cool, unused findings. But those days are in the past. All those days of rumors of death, hanging, and a T for Teen rating. We have science now to disprove them, and a lot of early footage, and tons of smart people have been able to reverse engineer a lot of the game. And they found some things. ELH, the twisting elemental ghost that would have attacked Luigi, a completely kind of functional multiplayer mode featuring Luigi, and a second player model of Mario. So, let's sit back, grab a box of cheese nips, and look at the complete developmental history of Luigi's Mansion. Our story begins in late 1999, back when the Nintendo 64 disk drive had just recently released in Japan. And Nintendo EAD, who went and developed several disk drive titles, decided that they wanted to create a new game. A game that would end up being Luigi's Mansion, but at this point it was simply the brainstorming stage of the project, and even though the game was beginning its creation in the era of the Nintendo 64, it wasn't exactly planned to be on the N64 per se. More like whatever console could support it once it started its development. And as time went on, it would become apparent that the N64 couldn't handle what they really wanted to do, so it was only natural to start development on Nintendo's brand new, yet to be revealed console, Project Dolphin, later called the GameCube. But I'm sure you're all curious, what ideas did the team come up with during this brainstorming stage that led them to develop on the GameCube? Well, let's start at the very beginning, back when the game wasn't about Luigi, or Mario, or anything like it was going to become. Back then, according to the game's director, it was much more like the dungeon exploration segments in The Legend of Zelda. More specifically, it was an exploration-based game set in a huge apartment complex. But that didn't last long, as they eventually moved from an apartment complex to a Japanese-style ninja house. And eventually, that ninja house was also changed and morphed into what the team called a European forward slash american style mansion dollhouse, with Mario as the main character. Alongside this mansion idea, there was also some other tests going on with the idea of desert levels that Mario could explore, but they just kept going back to that idea of exploring a dollhouse. It just felt so natural, because in real life when you look into a dollhouse, you do it through imaginary fourth wall, much like in Luigi's Mansion. So they decided to scrap the desert and move forward with this mansion idea, deciding pretty early on that it would have three floors and a basement to explore, all in a cool western style. According to the director of Luigi's Mansion, there was also a plan to add in a sort of, as he put it, RPG system into the game, where completing certain actions would cause the room to change, kind of like how pressing the button in the storage room moves the wall, but this would have been a lot more prevalent. But around that same time, they had the idea to include a vacuum in the game, and it eventually made it as the player's go-to tool for affecting the world. Of course, at this point in development, they needed more than just ideas, they needed a prototype, and the team got to work making a mansion that you could actually explore. While designing this, they also wanted to try out some different styles of lighting, just to see what would fit best in this indoor space. And during this experimenting, someone decided to try turning down those lights real low, causing the place to be filled with darkness and deep shadows. And at that moment, right there, was when they decided to make the place haunted. But of course Mario wouldn't be a good fit for a haunted house. He's a hero. He's a brave boy. They wanted a main character who would be spooked silly, and Mario just didn't fit the bill. They needed a character that wouldn't mind being a little cowardly, and that someone was Luigi. And fun fact, despite the fact that they wanted the protagonist to be scared silly, they actually had zero plans to spook the player. Tell that to little Andrew who had nightmares about the Luigi's Mansion ghosts. Now, as I said before, experimentation with lighting is basically what led the team to go for that spooky atmosphere. But it's also the reason they decided to skip out on the Nintendo 64 and develop for the GameCube. Turns out, as you would probably expect, getting that kind of dark, shadowy atmosphere complete with full dynamic lighting and crisp shadows would be a bit of a challenge to accomplish on the N64. So they decided to turn their attention to Project Dolphin. And since it was being developed alongside Luigi's Mansion, they could also make quite a few requests for the system, like having the graphics chip handle real-time shadows and how they interact with the environment. 
and the Dolphin team was more than happy to include that with the system, along with many other requests like with the GameCube controller itself. At that early time in development, the controller hadn't even been designed yet, so Luigi's Mansion TMS for a few things, like having two analog sticks. Turns out they wanted to have this kind of control scheme from the beginning, specifically having one stick for movement and the other for directional control, which turned out to be for Luigi's flashlight and vacuum later on. Because of the more complex controls on the sticks, after all, dual stick controls wasn't exactly a mainstream concept for consoles at the time, the team decided to lay off on the buttons. They didn't want to confuse the players too much. But once the controllers started being formed with all those glorious X and Y and Z buttons, they decided to map them to the Game Boy Horror, and in the end ended up using every single button on the controller. But there was definitely some deliberation on what buttons did what, like the A button for instance. The team noticed that it would be difficult for the player to use the A button while using the C stick, which I mean normally wouldn't be that big of a problem, but originally the sticks were flipped in Luigi's Mansion. You would use the C stick in this build to move around and the control stick for direction, which makes reaching the A button a lot more difficult. So they decided to have the vacuum control with the R button instead of A, with A ending up being the Mario and the oh yeah. button. Now I remember some people playing the game back then thinking, what was the point of having Luigi call out Mario? Why have a whole button dedicated to something that doesn't even have a purpose? Well, there actually was a reason for it and it wasn't just, let's use all the buttons on the controller. It was added in after a staff member suggested it could be used to reinforce the idea that Luigi is looking for Mario. I mean, besides some minor dialogue throughout the game after the intro, Luigi's goal of rescuing Mario isn't really mentioned all that much. So they decided to have Luigi scream out Mario! when pressing the A button, just to remind the player of what they're doing in this horrifyingly spooky mansion. You could tell a lot of care went into this game to make it easy to play and understand, but of course, they didn't want it to be too easy. The team wanted to strike this balance, making the game more of a short, replayable experience focusing on exploration rather than item collecting and fetch quests. Though, I mean, you do do a little bit of that with the fortune teller, but it's more of a back burner kind of thing and you can easily find the items just from exploring. Except for that random birdhouse where Mario's letter is. How was I even supposed to know that was there? Why would the letter be in the birdhouse? Still, even then, the team was smart and they put these flying fish ghosts around it so that way when you inevitably decide, I want to suck them up, the vacuum will shake the birdhouse oh, look at this, look. and cause the letter to fly out without the player really having to even think about it. But it still gives them the feeling that they found it themselves. <laughs> that is good game design. You know what else they were smart about? Adding two different control schemes. See, the team had a lot of discussion about this dual stick gameplay that director Kono wanted, with the team even creating several prototypes with different control schemes just to try them all out, like one that used just one stick instead of two. But Kono was adamant about wanting these dual stick controls, even if it would make the game more challenging for beginners. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the final game isn't particularly difficult, because the controls themselves were designed to add a layer of challenge to it. But in the end, Kono caved, and the team decided to add a standard control scheme option to the game instead of just the original, intended, sidestep controls. But even if zero people on the face of this planet use sidestep controls, that dual stick control scheme actually helped design the GameCube controller itself. Many of the testers who played using that control scheme felt it uncomfortable to use with the small C stick since, remember, at that point, you used it for Luigi's movement, meaning you were on that C stick the entirety of the game. So with that feedback in mind, they decided to make the controller C-Stick a bit larger. Which, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine this being any smaller. But some prototype versions of the controller have appeared over the years, and yeah, it does look like it had a smaller C-Stick and a huge control stick. Also, that Z button is giving me anxiety, so let's move on. Because the Luigi's Mansion team pretty much had their every wish fulfilled on the GameCube, they really could focus on making the game something truly unique. So, they went all out. I'm talking real-time shadows on every object. I'm talking realistic environmental effects like water, fire, ice, and I'm talking dust. I'm talking realistic dust here. Have you seen the dust in Luigi's Mansion? It responds like accurately to activity in the room, and that's because it took six months to program the dust in this game. I know, it's dedication. And here's the thing, the reason I've called you here is this debug counter right there. That is the dust counter. When you suck, it actually increases the counter, but it's not just a constant increase. It's actually dependent on how much dust is in the room. So it stops counting, but if I release more dust, it'll start counting again. Now that's good programming. Now with that freedom of creativity, they really had the ability to experiment with things in this game. While that one programmer was working on his dust for six months, Kono decided to try something else out. 
glasses-free 3D. Basically what the 3DS has, but for home consoles. Kono recalls setting up his dev kit with a secondary 3D display to try out this technology with Luigi's Mansion. However, because of the low resolution of the GameCube and the high cost of a 3D panel at the time, it just wasn't worth implementing. But he had hoped in the future that the technology would advance far enough to make it worthwhile. And it did, Kono. It did. Even if you never worked on Luigi's Mansion again, the dream of Luigi's Mansion 1 becoming 3D finally became a reality in 2018. Talking, I'm talking like he's dead. He's, he's fine. He's actually helped produce the 3DS himself, and so he technically turned his own wish into reality. Good for you, man. Now at this point, everything that we've talked about here has been going on behind the scenes. The public had no idea what was going on with Luigi's Mansion at the time. In fact, the first time that we ever got to see the game was at Space World 2000 during the Nintendo Sizzle Reel. And boy, was it sizzling hot. We had a ton of new GameCube reveals like Pokemon, Wave Race, Zelda, Perfect Dark, Metroid. Ah, so good. And of course, we also had Luigi's Mansion which despite just being some cutscenes, was actually running on GameCube hardware when they recorded it, to show the power of the system. And it turns out this short sizzle reel isn't the only place we get to see these scenes. A couple of them even made it into the final game, believe it or not. Like this quick clip of ghosts playing cards. It's kinda hard to see, but thankfully a site known as GamerWeb uploaded a higher quality image of it. Ooh, oh, that's much better. Turns out you can find this exact scene on the ghost portrificationizer. Right there. See? It's not a perfect match, though. Hmm. Is there anything else here that might look more like- Wait, hold on, go back! That's it! The texture on the ghost portrificationizer is literally the exact same texture as this TV. But that's not the only thing from the teaser that snuck its way into the final game. To show you, let's press pause. And going to the final game, let's press pause literally. Look familiar? Yeah, the final game uses a filtered screenshot of this screen from the Space World 2000 teaser. They just couldn't let the scene go. After all, the lighting and effects are just oh, beautiful. There was more than just this teaser shown off at Space World, though. Some other various clips were sent to the press during the show, this time with actual audio of Luigi going <laughs> and <laughs> and not to mention. <laughs> Sadly, all of this is still pre-rendered stuff. There was no gameplay shown at Space World 2000, so we can't see these crazy ghost designs in action. Well, that's not entirely true, actually. There's one more place where these ghosts were shown, and that's when Miyamoto was demonstrating the GameCube's controller. The presentation starts with the foyer from the teaser, and then focuses on this GameCube on the table. At this point it switches to gameplay with Miyamoto controlling the ghost on screen with his controller. He can squish it, rotate it, make it throw things, and burp, and he can make the ghost laugh too, so you can hear an early version of what the ghost would have sounded like. I'm not gonna lie, it sounds more like the seagull from Sunshine than a ghost, but... Hey, you know, this was just the first design for the spooky spirit. The next time we would see them is at E3 2001. So why don't we move forward a few months and check that out. Now it turns out there were two different builds that were shown off in the E3 trailer. The first was obviously the E3 build, but the second was something called the Nintendo Difference build because it was first shown off in an ad campaign showing off the Nintendo Difference. You can tell it's that build because it lacks the coin counter, unlike the playable demo on the show floor at E3. Not all of this was included though. These strange scare sequences with this weird border weren't included, and honestly I can't tell if it was part of the game or just a clever video editing trick. But, I mean it probably was part of the game because why on earth would you try to edit a border underneath UI? Just seems a little much for a video editor to do. Anyway, why don't we start our E3 journey by looking at first the E3 2001 trailer. Now I didn't accidentally reshow part of the Space World 2000 teaser. This footage was actually still being used for promotional purposes, even at E3. But don't worry, that's only for the beginning of the trailer. After this short refresher, it switches over to the first ever seen gameplay of Luigi's Mansion. And if you add in the footage taken from the show floor's playable demo, there's quite a bit of footage to look through, and of course, there's a lot of changes. As always, the Beta Compare Club took great care searching every inch of the footage. And if you want to check out all of their findings, both big and small, head over to the link below. But as for this video, we're going to be looking at some of the biggest, most fascinatingly spooky changes that were in the E3 2001 build. First off, the gameplay, which at this point doesn't even mention the whole point of Luigi being here is to rescue Mario. Instead, it's just like, hey, why not have fun exploring this mansion within the time limit? A very demo thing for them to do. In this build, the player had until 1.30 a.m. to explore the dark hallways of this spooky building, after which Egad would call Luigi and say something that we don't know because the text box is too bright and bloomed out on the footage. Oh well. After that, the player simply kicked out to the title screen and then the demo's over, ready for the next person in line. But Andrew, 
What about, dare I say it, Zombie Luigi? The one from the original Game Over sequence? No, actually he wasn't. That infamous creepypasta-inducing scene wasn't in this build of the game, or any build of the game for that matter. It was only in the E3 trailer, so it wasn't a Game Over screen. It had nothing to do with the storyline. None of that. Mario didn't disappear causing Luigi to get depressed, it was simply a trailer to entice people to play the game. That's all. Now there are some more gameplay elements in the game that were scrapped, and not just because it was only for a demo. These were all planned to be in the final game, but were scrapped for one reason or another. Like the Poltergust, whose design itself changed between E3 and release, as did the nozzle, which is bigger in this early build, and the hose attached to it, whenever it sucks up a ghost we get this big bulbous blob thing running through it to show that you've successfully captured a specter. Along with all of this, the flashlight was also bigger in this build, and fun fact, it's different in another way too. It can't turn off, and it wasn't even planned to until the end of development, when Miyamoto requested that the player have more control over Luigi's actions, and thusly use more buttons on the controller. So the idea they came up with was to make a new flashlight, one that could be turned off with the B button, letting ghosts get closer, and effectively allowing the player to be more strategic on how they handled their ghost capturing. Going back to E3, there's one more thing the Poltergust used to do. Explode! As you vacuum, this meter on the bottom of the screen would build up and then BAM! It exploded engulfed in flames. This, of course, was scrapped before release, but the meter down there was eventually repurposed as the fire, water, and ice meter, with the number being replaced with icons for each depending on what you have. It's funny though, in this build that Miyamoto plays on stage, which by the way is special with cheese because he's a cheater, he can use the water element, complete with its own unique nozzle that was scrapped. But the meter on the bottom? Yeah, it's not there. It doesn't appear at all. So basically the overheat meter literally flipped purposes, nowadays limiting the elements and making the vacuum unlimited instead of the other way around. Speaking of the HUD, there's some more changes here too, like the coin counter, which was designed to count all these early coins spilling out all over the floor and rotating about. But even if they were scrapped, both the coins and counter are still in the final game, the coins being out of bounds with no functionality other than its spinning animation, and the counter's code was recently discovered by YouTuber Grumpy Sergal, though sadly the counter is considered a lost cause since so much of the code was written over when it was assembled for release. A Luigi's Mansion modder who goes by the name of LM Finish managed to rework the finals money counter to look like the E3 build, but technically that's still not the original code, it's a mod. Next up is the heart counter, which despite it obviously being capped at 100, has a label there to spell it out for the player. But it turns out, in this build, there technically are points where it isn't capped at 100, all thanks to these guys, known by fans of the game as bashers. Here they serve kind of the same function as the bowling ghost in the final game, a small easy to suck up ghost that appears exclusively in the hallways. Well, actually in even earlier builds of the game, like the Nintendo Difference build, they were seen in the bedroom, and were also a different color. In the E3 build though, they were only seen in the hallway, and always purple, with their only form of attack being sneaking up on Luigi while he's invisible, and then spooking the boy. This would cause the poor boy's max health to drop to 50, and him scurrying away. After standing up, luckily it increases back to 100, but the health points still remain at 50, or at least it would if Miyamoto turned off his game genie. So at worst, it takes away half your health, and theoretically at best, it doesn't hurt you at all as long as your health was already below 50. Technically though, the Nintendo Difference build is different here too. Their bashers only took 30 health points, and Luigi didn't fall on the ground and crawl away, he was just normally spooked. Either way though, this seems really unfair for Luigi. I mean, after all, you can't even see the guy until he's right up on you. Well, ex you know, except for that little, what is that, dust? Spectre juice? I don't know. That's where the Game Boy Horror came in handy, though people didn't know that was what it was called back then because it was lower on the screen. See that little light on top? That was to let you know that a ghost was near, and that's how you would be able to tell if a basher was approaching. But it turns out, this radar doesn't only react to bashers, it also goes off for normal ghosts too, which highlights another change. Originally, these quote-unquote normal ghosts could appear in the hallways as well, though in the final game, only special ghosts can, like the bowling ghost I mentioned earlier. Honestly, I'm really glad they only used the Game Boy Horror for detecting booze, because it would have been really annoying to have to hear for basically more than half the game. And by the way, speaking of booze, they make an appearance in this E3 build too, just in a different way. Originally, they acted the same as flying fish ghosts, just floating around until they eventually got sucked up by Luigi. Now, I should note that flying fish do appear in this build too, in the washroom specifically, coming out of the toilet. 
or sorry, in this build it's called the laboratory. And actually, technically it shouldn't have any ghosts in it at all, since in the final game you just talk to a toad to turn on the lights. Those flying fish were probably a good reason why the boost changed, after all they pretty much function the same, except you can cause boost to stop moving when you shine your flashlight on them. Also, now that I think about it, why are Boos even in Neville's room? In the final game, books are supposed to be the only annoying thing here, not small flying ghosts. But the person playing this demo was able to get past them, captured Daddy who only had 50 health points instead of 100, and was rewarded not with a key and pearls, but with an explosion of coins from an open ghost chest? I mean, it, it looks slightly transparent, so I, I guess it's an undead ghost chest. Wait, have I talked about controls yet? I mean, I guess I did a little. The control sticks are still flipped in this build and use the sidestep control scheme exclusively. Not to mention, the Z button does something completely removed from the final game. Crouch. Yeah, Luigi could originally squat down in order to dodge attacks, but no one at the show really knew you could squat, so thankfully we got lucky and someone just pressed it by accident. Now what about... Ow! <laughs> Music! Jeez Louise. Well, this demo has a very strange song list that includes a very weird rendition of the Luigi's Mansion theme. It's not orchestral at all, it's all synthesized, so take a listen. Turns out that's not the only rendition of this theme. There's also a special track that plays when Luigi clears a room that uses bells instead of Luigi's whistling. And it turns out a user by the name of Effie managed to recreate the track using sounds from the final game because it turns out the instruments that were used in this version of the theme are still in the final game. And last but not least, we have EGAD's lab, which is completely different from the final game. And sadly, we don't have a high quality rip, and we don't have a high quality recreation, so we just have this medium noise reduced quality that was made by yours truly. Take a listen. <laughs> Now that we've went through all these major gameplay changes, why don't we check to see how the story changed? And yes, it did actually change a bit from E3. First off at the demo's title screen, there were a couple of options that allowed you to either skip the intro or play from the beginning. So instead of skipping this time, let's see what the intro has to offer us. Okay, right off the bat, the intro cutscene is different. Starting with the different angle in the trees, and then it kind of sort of looks a bit like the finals returning to the mansion scene. But it definitely looks nothing like the finals intro with Luigi looking at the map. Notably, EGAD's lab isn't here, and there's a reason for that, which we'll learn once Luigi enters the mansion. Here, you'll notice he's holding the flashlight with both hands instead of one, which can actually be replicated in the final game by messing with a parameter in RAM. Apparently, Luigi has eight holding methods in the final game, the first being the two-handed one from E3, and the last one being used in the final game. Now let's take Luigi upstairs, have him interact with the door, and once that flag's been set, head back downstairs to see a different colored ghost ready to spook Luigi with his spooky key. Except Luigi isn't scared, like at all. He's just kind of standing there, unlike the final game. Though, and as you've probably already noticed by now, all of the ghosts, not just the one in this intro, are all different colors compared to their final counterparts. And the reason for that is because originally, any ghost could be any color. There weren't these specific colors for specific ghosts like it is in the final game. 
There were body types, and then there were colors, and they could all be mixed and matched at a will, depending on what the developers felt like that day. Oh, the ghost left. And now Luigi's got the key. No cinematic, but hey, you know, it's fine. Now we can check out what's beyond that door, and it turns out, it's a spooky boy. Ah, says Luigi, unlike the final game where he just screams. Ugh, says the spooky boy in return. Both of these were cut out from the final game, as well as when the three ghosts at the end say, Boo, when Luigi and Egad run away. I I'm sorry, in this build, he's called Dr. Elvin Gad, with one D instead of two. He also, like, really actually gets mad at Luigi here, saying that he's intruding on his house. Since apparently in this version of the game, he's been living inside the mansion for quite some time, thinking it was vacant, and being a ghost researcher, it was perfect for his studies. Perhaps this is the reason why the lab wasn't outside. He's been living inside the mansion after all, so maybe, just maybe, in this build, his lab is also somewhere below the mansion. It'd be a very interesting idea, but of course, that's all speculation. I wish Egad would have told us where it was at, but instead he continues his talk about the mansion and mentions that it's actually famous for being haunted, which contradicts the final storyline where the mansion is simply an illusion that just appeared one day. But no, here in this build it's a tourist destination lived in by an old man. Still, sounds pretty spooky to me. After talking with Egad a bit, Luigi returns to the mansion, and we're back where we would have been if we had just simply skipped the intro. But now that we have full range of the mansion, since no one bothered to lock any doors, well, except for two doors, the main door in the foyer, whose keys you get from Chauncey's room, and the upstairs hallway, which can be unlocked with a key from the living room. Other than that though, everything else is unlocked. Let's see what rooms have changed. The bedroom is a good place to start, featuring a different layout with two beds instead of one double bed. And hey, there's Lydia. In the final game, you have to pull back a curtain to create a breeze and cause her to move, but in this build, a bed is in the way, so that's not gonna happen. Here we just sit and wait for her to turn. And bam, the battle begins, with only 50 health points instead of 100, just like Neville. And after capturing both their parents against their will, let's go pay their kid a visit in Child's Room. Interesting name for a nursery. Nah, but it seems like Chauncey isn't here to give us that epic boss battle, so I guess we'll move on to the bathroom. Hello there. This little gag was met with lots of laughs when it was shown off to the press, as you can imagine. In this build though, when you pull back the curtain, Petunia isn't there waiting for you. Instead, there's nothing. What about the old dining room? What does it have to offer? A lot, actually. First off, this door was replaced with a cabinet later on that I used to hide behind because I was too scared fighting Mr. Lugs because those gosh dang fireballs are freaking scary. Also, that fire was apparently originally a grandfather clock, whose face texture was later used as part of the portrificationizer. Good to see it being put to good use. What else, what else? Well, there are chairs on both sides of the table in this build, and there are red flames on the candle instead of purple, and Mr. Lugs is nowhere to be seen. Since he's not here, there's no waiter ghosts, and in their place are feisty normal ones. And he's going to die, yep, and he died. Okay, all right. And I guess our E3 journey ends here, and that's probably a good thing. I'm starting to get all jumpy from all those spooky E3 changes. Honestly, I, I feel like something out there is like watching me. Something that wants me to talk about it. Some sort of ghostly rumor that just needs to finally be put to rest. <laughs> all right, this is the Safari Ghost. Or should I say a deviant art drawing of the Safari Ghost by the Nibil20091. Now, who is this diabolically dashing spirit? Well, it all stems from Nintendo Power issue 149, where this image of an early Safari room is shown along with the message, when your gold busted mission takes you to the trophy room, proceed with caution. If you meet up with the ghost of a hunter, he'll want to add Luigi to his collection. At this point, I think it's about time to say, it's a made up tale. It's a total fabrication. This one was invented by a writer. It's not real. It never was. They made it up. I mean, this issue of Nintendo Power came out a month after the game released in Japan. If it were real, it would have been in the Japanese version of the game, or at least in the files of it, which it is not. And technically, according to the game's files, the Japanese version was actually finished on August 28, 2001, specifically at 3 in the morning. That was almost two months before the release of this Nintendo Power issue, and the writers of this article would have been very well aware that this ghost didn't exist. So no, the ghost wasn't removed to keep the game from getting a teen rating. All of those rumors came to be simply because a writer at Nintendo Power wanted to make a joke. Funny how that happens. To be fair, what really got people confused was the fact that this article uses a ton of early promo stuff, 
Despite the fact that the key art is from the final version, they still used an early ghost here, and all the screenshots are from an early build as well. It's nice though, because they do show off a number of changes, completely different from the E3 2001 build in May, and the retail build released in September. Like a first person camera on the Game Boy Horror, and this ghost counter looks strangely like a repurposed overheat meter. Turns out, this meter is still in the retail build. LM Finish, who I mentioned before, actually made a cheat code to have it reappear in the final version of the game, and it's completely functional too. It can only count up to 10 ghosts, and after that the meter just stays full until you warp into a new area, or the ghost reset command is used like when Luigi finishes training in Egaz's lab. Man, Anya's findings on Luigi's mansion are so freaking interesting. You know, when I first made my video around, I guess, eight years ago, this page on the cutting room floor was incredibly small. I mean, decompressing the files in Luigi's Mansion and especially viewing the models, it was unheard of. But over the years, people figured it out. And now, this page has exploded. There's unused models, animations, and even now, just recently found an unused multiplayer mode that still functions. So why don't we check out some of the most interesting unused findings in Luigi's Mansion. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the game's internal name. Over the years, we've heard some interesting ones before, like Mario Galaxy being called SMR for Super Mario Revolution. But for Luigi's Mansion, the root file in the game simply refers to the game as Project One. Huh. Let's boot up the game and head over to EGAD's lab, shall we? Here, with the help of an action replay code, we can walk around the place, something not possible when playing the game normally. Turns out there's a lot more to see in this lab besides EGAD's gorgeous complexion. There's actually a whole area over here to the right that you can't see in the final game. Well, you do technically get a view of it as a pre-rendered background behind EGAD when he calls you on the Game Boy Horror. Now what are these rooms exactly? Well, a sign on this door says training room, so I'm gonna guess that one's the training room. Though I guess it doesn't particularly matter because there's nothing behind any of these doors, and they were never able to be opened either because they were modeled into the environment. The ladder to the left, thankfully, is usable. You can actually climb all the way to the top, but once you reach it, you'll fall right back down onto EGAD and start shivering? Because apparently EGAD is cold as ice. Now, why did they bother making this lab so big if you can't see half of it? Well, it turns out originally, you were supposed to be able to walk around it. You could have used the doors to enter different rooms and climbing up the ladder would take you back to the mansion. Using the Game Boy Horror here, which once again isn't possible in normal gameplay, it'll show you the map of the room with Luigi in it, as well as some unused text that says Underground Lab on top. Notice how the L in Lab isn't capitalized. This gives us a hint as to when it was made, likely sometime close to E3, since much like the demo, the second word is never capitalized, probably because it was so rushed to get translated before the show. I mean, look, the master bedroom in this demo is literally called Bedroom 1. And much like the underground lab, they didn't even bother to capitalize the second word room either. Without any hacks or cheats, you can still pull up this map in the training room and gallery just with different highlighted rooms with Luigi in it. But if we know what these three rooms are, what's this one? Turns out it's the Ghost Portrificationizer room, and according to his unused map model highlighting the room, it would have been accessible too. There's even an early model of that room that went unused called h underscore zero two dot bin. It's incredibly similar to the E3 version and even has a little door jut out here, which isn't in the final version of the room because, well, the player wouldn't exactly need a door here since they can't walk around the room normally anyway. According to the map, the door would have led to the underground lab, but for some reason, instead of a door being here that leads to the gallery, there's a dirt pile. So at this point, it doesn't seem like the portrificationizer room would have actually connected to the gallery, which is weird, because according to the map, that means there would be no way to get there. Maybe earlier on, there was a door connected to the gallery via the training room, but that's all speculation. For all we know, things could have been planned to be wildly different than this map shows, which by the way was edited up until two months before E3 2001, around 1am, and it wasn't messed with again after that. It turns out this isn't the only unused map in Luigi's Mansion, there's another one that covers the entirety of the mansion, and it includes this interesting Luigi doll that would have functioned as the Luigi's in this room marker. It turns out this unused map, you know, is functionally the same as the final game, but it's the layout of the E3 demo. So now we can actually look at the E3 demo in full with the help of an easy to view map. So let's take a look, shall we? 
Well, the first thing you'll definitely notice is all of these boarded up doors that were designed to keep players from accessing unfinished parts of the game, like the ante room, the twins room, the ballroom, the billiards room, the laundry room, the fortune teller's room, and the stairs to the basement. Not to mention, sometimes it's not boards blocking your path, it's huge piles of crates, like these that kept the player from reaching the rec room and the second and third floor of the mansion. But there aren't just boarded up doors to show you, there's also some additional doors too that aren't in the final game, like a new door to the conservatory directly across from the bathroom, but it's also boarded up. The door that leads to the conservatory in the final build would have been right here, but it's not, and happens to be one of the few doors that weren't in the E3 build and were added in later like the left door to the courtyard, and the doors in the hallways that led to the stairs. In the dining room, there's also another blocked door which shouldn't be there. We saw it earlier in the video, but now we know where it leads according to this map, which turns out to be the projection room, which in the final game could only be reached through the billiards room. And moving further down the dining hall, there's another door that was scrapped before release, which would have led you back to the hallway. And across from that door is another scrap door that would have connected the dining room to the billiards room unlike the retail bill where they never connect. It seems like having multiple doors to the same room was a very common thing in the E3 version of the mansion. I mean, look, even the kitchen had a door straight to the laundry room, though like many of the other ones, it too was blocked. Because of all those blocked doors, that's all the players could see in the E3 demo that was on the show floor. But thanks to this map, we can see what other secrets the mansion held that players back in 2001 couldn't document for us. Like an additional door on the second floor to the wardrobe, which is actually a pretty big deal because it means that the entire second floor would have been connected. You wouldn't have had to go to the trouble of going all the way back downstairs from the second floor hallway to go right back up some stairs in the foyer to finally reach the wardrobe room. It was all connected together. Heck, even this hallway door here led right to the second floor of the foyer. The third floor also had a ton of scrap doors too. In fact, originally, those doors connected each of the rooms to every single one of their surrounding rooms. And hey, look at that. I spy an extra room here that was scrapped before release. Don't know exactly what it was, but it's still pretty cool. Last is the basement, which is surprisingly almost the same, except for the break room being connected via the left hallway instead of the one below it, meaning that the door was on the left side rather than on the wall closest to the player. Turns out though, that early breaker room is still in the game's files under the wonderful name B1 underscore C underscore 67. See that door on the left side? It's a perfect match. And remember how I said that the stairs to the basement were blocked off in the demo? Well, that is true. On the show floor, there were TVs playing videos of Luigi's Mansion that showed things not available in the demo. And in one of those videos, we get a small glimpse of that early breaker room that went unused, or at least a version similar to it. See, it looks incredibly similar, but there's no door on the left wall. And there are no pipes either, but the rest of it looks so eerily similar. Sadly, we can't date this model since there's no entries file listing its last compile date, so it's unknown if this unused room is before E3 or after, but since this version has more stuff than E3, I'm going to assume after. There's some more stuff from E3 2001 left in the game's files too, like this image with text saying from the beginning, which you probably remember from the title screen in the show floor demo. The Game Boy Horror's timer is also in the files too and fully functional to boot by using a cheat code. Except that it doesn't end at 1.30, it actually goes till 6 a.m. before resetting back to zero. Using that same cheat with a different parameter, you can also bring back the first person camera as well that we saw from the Nintendo Power magazine. And there's also that water nozzle we saw in Miyamoto's presentation of the game, as well as another unused model that it's exactly the same except red. This was gonna be used when spraying out dust, otherwise known when you press L without any elements. The early version of the Poltergust from E3 is here too, as well as a tomato. You remember tomato? No? Oh, I guess I forgot to mention that one. See, in this early screenshot of the kitchen given to the press around E3 time, we get our only glimpse at the scrapped chef ghost and this tomato. It's unknown exactly what it would have done, but likely the ghost would have used it to attack Luigi at some point. But we're still not quite done with all this E3 stuff yet. We still got this early, unused vase that later found its way in the background of Brawl, and this cute ball ghost, which can be seen here in the E3 trailer. But technically, while this model, its functionality, and all of these colors went unused, a duplicate of the model was repurposed in the final game. Can you guess where? It's the stars of the observatory. Well, actually in the 3DS version, they're called Shining Ghosts. But back then they looked like falling stars, so we called them falling stars. Even the model itself is called Star, 
So it's almost like originally they tried to hide the fact that it was once a ghost, and instead pass it off as a star. And speaking of stars, check out this unused star door, which according to advertisements for the game, would have led Luigi to the twin room. There's also an unused heart door too in the game's files, which would have been for the nursery, both of which were only seen for a little bit of time between E3 2001 and Space World 2001, at which point the game was basically the final version. There's actually an incredibly early door design in the game's files too, simply called Door. It comes in two different model formats, which is strange for the game, and was last edited February 23rd, 2001, about six months after the game's reveal at Space World and almost three months before E3. And since we're on the subject of Space World and these early designs, did you know that these incredibly early ghost designs that used to haunt these halls are unused in the final game as two icons? No model, sadly. But we did get a little lucky, because even though these early ghost models aren't here anymore, some early animations are, specifically from the E3 build of the game. There's early appearing animations, as well as basher animations that have been ported by the game's developers to every single one of these ghosts. There's bashers scaring, bashers failing, bashers getting caught in a flashlight. The twirler even has an extra E3 animation too that the others don't. An early ground pound. But you know what else it has? A punching animation. In the final game, the twirler never punches. That's safe for, well, the puncher ghost. And I guess the gold ghost also does some punching too, rendering this animation unused for the twirler. Also, all of these ghosts have one more unused animation in common, being blown away which would have originally maybe been an early animation for when they escaped Luigi's vacuum. But that's not all. Oh, no, no, no. We've also got early unused variations of animations for the grabbing ghosts, like spawn, scare, and fail. And the ceiling ghost also has waiting, which never happens because it immediately scares, capturing, which also never happens because it has zero HP and gets sucked up immediately, frustrated, which would play whenever it failed to blow up Luigi, and vanishing upwards? That's strange. It's called Ceiling Ghost for a reason. It hangs down from the ceiling. There's no point where it flies upward like that. It was later replaced with this swinging animation, which makes a lot more sense. Unless originally, it didn't always fall from the ceiling. Oh, and also the Bowling Ghost has some similar unused animations too, like chasing even though it never moves, and capturing even though it has zero health. Now, there's a few more animations I still want to talk about. One is for Lydia, specifically the one from E3 where she turns around and becomes vulnerable, and the rest are for Luigi. Not the model that was used in the game though, but instead an unused Luigi model, which honestly doesn't look all that different. What makes him interesting is all of these early animations he's bundled with. Some of them are actually from Space World 2000, but most are from E3, like squatting, walking while squatting, barrel rolling, and two different temper tantrums, a small one and a demon exorcism. Now, of course, this isn't actually a demon animation. I, this is just a joke. You don't need to write any creepypasta. Okay. But you know, there is one other creepypasta-like animation in the game. Though it's more than just an animation. It's more like a, a state of being. It's poisoning Luigi. Here, let me show you. By using an action replay code, we can actively poison Luigi, causing him to move around erratically, uh, losing coins and health. And at the end of the animation, he'll slap his face in order to get back to normal. Yeah, this animation uses an otherwise unused eye texture, and the current consensus is that it was originally going to be triggered by a poison mushroom, where instead of him shrieking, he would, uh, freaking die. But you know, those sad eyes of Luigi's pain show up somewhere else in the game too. These early unused ending graphics, which would have likely appeared at the end of the game depending on which rank you got. These images were built on July 13th, which is about a month after the game's release, so they're really not that old. Also, in that ending folder, you've also got the file Soshite, which goes unused as well. It translates to, and now, a present from the doctor, with doctor referring to Professor E. Gad, since his Japanese name uses the same honorific here, pronounced Hakase, which means doctor or an expert. Remember how in the final game, E. Gad uses the treasure Luigi steals, I mean, well, yeah, steals, to give him a new house? Well, taking that into account, it doesn't seem so odd that originally there would have been some text here that says, hey, the professor gave you a gift. Wasn't that nice of him to pay for it with your own money? And since we're on the subject of unused graphics, why don't we check out some early placeholder textures? Like this daisy render from Mario Tennis for the N64, simply called Test, and was used as a placeholder for the posters you vacuum off the wall. 
Or how about this GameCube texture that was likely a placeholder for the psychedelic backgrounds for bosses like Chauncey? And fun fact, the GameCube in this texture is an early design that includes a transparent cover to show the disc spinning. This is the same early design that was used in the Super Mario 128 demo. And honestly, it feels like I talk about this demo every single time I make a video. And hey, if you're interested in this demo, why don't you check out my video on Super Mario Galaxy where I talk about it in full with Scott the Waz. Wink? There are also a ton of icons that went in use too, a couple of them being ones that would have shown when scanning objects with the Game Boy Horror. It's this key and this boo. The key was likely from scanning a chest, and the boo? Well, it probably would have been shown when scanning furniture with boos hiding in them. If that's true, it means originally you wouldn't have to use your radar to find them. All you would have to do is scan every single object in the room. What fun! But that's not all the icons we've got. We've also got some that would have been shown in dialogue windows like Bowser, Mario, a gold ghost, Nana, and a green toad. These three even have their own colored dialogue boxes that one I used too. It's pretty obvious where they would have been used. Bowser would have been at the final boss. The gold ghost was probably from the scrap dialogue in the intro of it going ugh and boo. Mario was from when he screams out during the well sequence and was actually later used in the 3DS port of the game. Nana probably came from getting smacked with yarn balls and the green toad is from back when toads had color variations, not all red. In the final game, with the help of some cheats, you can make the toad green to match that scrap dialogue icon. Some other unused color variations are also available for ghosts too, like shy guys and mice. And those aren't the only unused ghosts we can find in the game. Check out this early bogmire, complete with a ravishing lower lip. This was compiled July 13th, so a month and a half before the final build of the game. Now, this is cool and hip and all that, but what about ghosts that were completely removed from the game? Like, not an early version, but something we've never seen in the game at all. Well, today's your lucky day, viewer, because we do have that. It's called L, a textureless monstrosity complete with animations for appearing, moving, attacking, and getting hurt. As I mentioned before, it has no textures. In fact, it doesn't even have a UV map to even begin putting textures on it. So either it never made it far enough to be textured, or it was going to be colored simply by shaders or particles. And speaking of particles, it has some that would have likely been used for attacks, like fire and ice. It even has these things called cores. Three, in fact, one for each element in the game. So it looks like Elch would have originally been an elemental boss used to attack Luigi with all the elements from the game, but in the end, it was sadly scrapped. This boss happens to have been built around a month after E3 2001. Now, of course, there are some more simplistic, less interesting unused models left in Luigi's Mansion, which, with the power of video editing, I will make appear now. We have a golden table, a ladder for the study, a bathroom drawer, a love seat for the billiards, early pictures, an early medicine cabinet, a baby mobile, as I've learned is pronounced, a phonograph with a working animation, and, last but not least, room 01A, which, actually, LM Finish has brought it into the game. It could have simply been a test room or maybe an early version of the Seeker Room, but we're not quite sure because it's so simplistic. There is, however, an actual test room left over in the game along with some other removed rooms, which are very, as some might call it in the business, spooky. So this is the test map. Yeah, it's a spooky room. This room is complete with a floating Mario portrait, a crying toad, a Luigi arm for cutscenes that's just hanging out in midair, some fire, the butler's candles midway through the floor, and King Boo himself, just without his crown. But this isn't the only room here, as you could probably guess by these doors. Opening the left door, or walking through it, that works too, will lead you to the male floating Whirlinda, who never exposes his heart as he's missing his true love, or more specifically, their rotating dance object. The door in the back of the main area leads to a bunch of tables with collision mapping only on its legs, so you can partially walk through them all. That might seem a little empty, lame, but it turns out on the invisible plane of existence, there's a generator in here, meant to spawn an object of the developer's choosing. It doesn't activate though, so nothing happens, but it turns out the reason for that is the fault of the developer. See, the activator in this room has the wrong name for the generator it's supposed to activate. Renaming it to the actual generator in the room causes a gold rat to spawn whenever Luigi walks in, just like it was supposed to, since this room was designed for testing the rat running around under tables. And fun fact, the thing that tells the rat where to move is called a path, and there are even more paths in here than there are objects to use them, which gives us a glimpse on what was tested in this test map. Things like standard mice, skeleton ghosts, waiters, and there are even six additional paths for the Whirlindas. 
Sadly, these paths don't work anymore. And speaking of not working, let's move to the room on the right, which once again includes the foyer stairs as well as some ladders for testing purposes. Not to mention, King Boo is back. But stay far away, because getting close to him causes the game to crash, because it activates this cutscene with Luigi at the altar and warps him to very specific coordinates. Those coordinates, however, are outside the boundaries of this room, and the game, in an effort to keep Luigi in the room, will crash the game instead. Looks like Luigi's not going to be leaving here anytime soon. The other three unused maps turn out to be very different versions of the gallery. We've got map 5, which includes the unicorn statues from the balcony instead of the angels, and King Boo's room is incredibly... meh, compared to the final. Not to mention, doesn't this version of the gallery seem a little... small? Turns out it actually is, and if you replace the final gallery with this one, the Clockwork Soldiers, Biff Atlas, Slim Bankshot, Sir Weston, Uncle Grimly, Vincent Van Gore, Bogmere, and Boolicious. Dang it, Boolosses. I, I literally, since I was a kid, I always called Boolosses Boolicious. I, I have no idea why. Anyway, they're not in this gallery. M moving on, we've got another version of the gallery here, which is very similar to the last, except it's much longer even longer than the final version of the gallery. Could this mean that more ghosts were originally planned? Maybe, it's plausible, but it could also just be that they were playing with room skills to see what would work better and this one just happened to be longer. You never know. The last version of the gallery is a lot different looking, matching the style of the training room more than the finals gallery. Perhaps originally, the gallery was supposed to have the same underground look and feel as the rest of Ega's lab. There's nothing here that's really functional though. The only thing here that would have done something is an event that might have been activated by talking with Egad, but it doesn't work anymore and has since been replaced by devs with the event where Lydia says, oh dear, such a draft. For our last topic, I've saved a very interesting and very recent find in Luigi's Mansion, and it all has to do with this unused Mario model, which has been stretched to be the same proportions as Luigi, and it's really weirding me out to be honest. For years, we had no idea what the purpose was for, except that maybe it could have been a playable character, or maybe for a scrap multiplayer mode. And it turns out, they were actually right. There is a scrap multiplayer mode that still works in the files of Luigi's Mansion, and it was all discovered by Kirby Mimi. A friend of mine who goes by the name of Swankybox released a video on this finding recently, so be sure to check out that video, link in the description. But for now, let's just kind of give a synopsis on the findings directly from the users of the Luigi's Mansion modding Discord server. Now, in order to get this to work, all you need is a little action replay code to cause a second Luigi to spawn controllable with the second controller. It is imperfect, of course. Luigi 2 spawns without his vacuum and invisible. So both these issues needed to be fixed manually before playing. And while you do play, you need to make sure Luigi 1 does most of the work, since Luigi 2 still has a few other issues, like difficulty opening doors. But this whole thing is much more than just simply spawning a second Luigi. There's also a smart split screen function, where the screen would split in two when the players were far enough apart, and come back together when they're close enough. It's, it's honestly incredible that all this is still here and still semi-works. Now the thought is that the unused Mario model that we saw earlier was supposed to be the second player, but the mode was scrapped before he got put in it. I mean, not gonna lie, having a tall stretched out Mario rescuing Mario with Luigi is kinda strange, but maybe they had plans to work around that. There is an unused string in the game mentioning a mission mode, so perhaps something like that was planned, but was eventually, sadly scrapped. Hi, I'm still here. We still got some unused music and sounds to listen to actually, and some of them haven't even been documented yet. Take these unused Luigi voice clips for instance. I got you. Hang on to Mario. Luigi got you. Whew, mamma mia. That one sounded a lot more like Waluigi, to be honest. Anyway, we've got a couple more sounds to look at. The first one is actually from E3, when Luigi was scared by a basher. Whoa! And next there's this one, which actually was later used in the Nintendo 3DS port's commercial for the game. Take a listen. Ow! Oh! Oh! Nice doggy! Nice doggy! Oh, pet, pet! Nice doggy! Ow! Oh! 
Next up, we've got some actual songs. The first one, well, I guess is more or less a song. It was used on the title screen of the E3 demo. Take a listen. Spooky. Next up is Baby Room, which as you can probably assume has something to do with Chauncey. And it turns out it's actually an unused part of the final song that happens when you talk to Chauncey for the first time. Next up is Totaka Song, which I know is already in the game on the control select screen in the training room, but this is a different rendition of it with an actual purpose besides being an easter egg. It was to be a part of Melody's Quiz! In fact, it can actually be put back in the game with a little bit of cheating, so why don't we give it a try for ourselves? Well, yes, I would love to listen. I wrote that. No, you didn't. The answer is Totakeke's theme. Well, that was riveting and spooky and spookily riveting. There's just a little bit more to go now with our last few unused songs, like this drum beat. And this remix of the Mario Bros theme. This remix is called Teresa Demo 2 for some reason or another, and can you guess what Teresa Demo 1 is? Turns out it's the music for when boos are released onto the mansion in the final game. Gonna be honest with you, I have no idea why it was called that. Unless, of course, it was like some second cutscene involving boos where this remix would have played, but it was ultimately removed from the game. Next up, we have a song that goes unused twice. The first one is called Space Room, and the second one is actually a shorter version of it called Total Score. Now, some think this may have been used when clearing all of the ghosts in the room, but I have a different theory. It's called Total Score, right? So I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, it was supposed to play whenever you see the player's total cash. Kind of like this mock-up I made. I don't, I don't know why I did that, I just wanted to give myself a video editing challenge at 4.30 in the morning. Last but not least, we have some of the spookiest sounds that went unused in Luigi's Mansion. And you know what the best part is? We have no idea what they were used for, so that just makes it all the more mysterious. So let's get a little more atmospheric. Now, let us listen to some of the strangest, spookiest unused sounds in Luigi's Mansion playing over some spooky stock footage that I found on page three of Google. The spookiest page. Let's take a listen. Well, hey, congratulations on finishing the whole video. And as a little treat for you, a stay to the end, I want to tell you about LM Finish's Luigi's Mansion mod called Luigi's Mix Collection, which sets out to accurately recreate the E3 demo we looked at so much in this video. It's been worked on for over four years and set to release in early 2020, so if you've ever wanted to play the E3 demo like I have, be sure to check out LM Finish's channel for updates. And also, just why not go ahead and check out all the channels I've listed below to thank all the people who made this video a reality. Casserole, Geeky Luigi and LM Finish for helping with the research, Kumu, Blue Brew Music, Panman14, and Scruffy for the amazing remixes, and of course, thank you all to the patrons who help support the show. And if you're interested in becoming a patron, just know, you can get a free Beta64 sticker if you're an active patron of any amount by the end of 2019. Alright, I hope you all have an amazing day. Thank you all so much for watching.